if you will, to Psalm 91, verse 1. Psalm 91, verse 1. And one thing my grandfather taught me, it's why we do it every Sunday. Uh, One thing my grandfather taught me is he said, Lee, before you read the word, you pray that the Holy Spirit would be your teacher to teach you everything that you need to know when you read it. So let's pray for that. Let's pray. Father, as we have an opportunity to explore your word, it is the truth, the only truth. I pray that you would give us wisdom and understanding that we have discernment from it father from your holy spirit that we would every one of us would truly take hold from your word which you have for us today we thank you father that we're here freely assembling and able to receive it and read it and so god we thank you that it will change us it will change us for your glory not ours it will change us in jesus name i pray that you alone are seen and heard not me but that you alone would get all of the honor, glory, and praise, Father. We recognize that you have power to do all things. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. God is good, amen? God is good. Psalms 91, verse 1, and we're going to read through the entirety of the psalm, and then we're going to come back and talk about it. This is what the Word of God says, praise the Lord. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night nor the arrow that flies by day nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near to you. Amen, church? You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked because you have made the Lord God your dwelling place, the Most High who is my refuge. No evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and on the adder. The young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Amen and amen. Let's talk about this together, church. Go back to the beginning of the 91st Psalm and let's look at verse 1 and 2. Psalm 91, 1 and 2 says this, he who dwells in the shelter, okay, think about that, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord God, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I what? Trust. Now think about that. God is our shelter. Everybody say God's our shelter. All right, because this is what we're going to really focus on here over the next few moments. God is our shelter. And this is what's really cool about this Hebrew word shelter. When you look up the word shelter, uh, not, not, not just in the Hebrew, if you just go into the, into, the dic- in, into the English, but also in the Hebrew, it doesn't matter. It's going to mean the same thing uh, in this, this point of the text. Uh, it states that a shelter is something to protect you from a storm. A shelter is going to be something to protect you from a storm. How many of you can testify that God has kept you safe during a storm in life? Okay, so this is, this is you acknowledging God is my shelter uh, in a storm of my marriage, in a storm with my children, in a storm in my life, in a storm with my grandchildren, in a storm in my job. God is my shelter, and shelter means it is going to protect you from a storm. Notice uh, verse 1, look at it, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most 
high will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, verse 2, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Now notice in both Hebrew and the English uh, that, that the, the, the word shelter is a place, a safe haven and protection during storm. It doesn't tell you that storms won't come. Matter of fact, quite the opposite in the definition. It lets you know that there is storms that's going to come on the horizon. So every one of us as a believer, every one of us as a non-believer, if there's anyone in here that is not a believer yet, uh, whether you're saved or unsaved, you're going to have a storm or storms in your life sooner or later. Can everybody agree with that? And so we're going to have storms in our lives. The benefit of being of a believer, the benefit of being saved in Jesus Christ is this, is that God is my literal shelter. God is my protector. He is my safe place, my safe haven. He is my refuge. And your, your safe place, your safe haven is the place that you run when you see it's about to get bad. It's about to get bad. And we need to be praying. I've, we've got someone here that wants to, wants to take a team of people down to Florida as soon as the, the mess comes through. And so if you've got that in your spirit, you need, to, you need to really be praying about going down because we've got some people that want to go down and be a blessing uh, and share the gospel while cleaning up down there. So if that's, if that's on you, then that's on you. And, and, and that's going to be a great thing. And we're definitely going to get behind it and support it. Amen? But let me, let me just tell you what I'm reminded of as, as I talk about that, the, the hurricane uh, in Florida. My wife and I were watching TV late one night in, in the living room, and uh, there was a lady there who owned a, a, a pizza business, her and her family, and she, they asked her, they said, why haven't you left? And she said, well, we don't need to leave. When we built our home, we built a Category 5 hurricane-proof home. And so what she knew is, if I just make the investment in a Cat 5 home, I don't have to leave when the Cat 5 shows up. And as I read scripture about shelter, I'm just telling you, when you've got God as your shelter and something comes up in your life, there's need not fret, you need not run because you're in the only shelter that can hold you up for whatever it is that you're going through. You're in the only shelter that can keep you safe for whatever it is that you're going through. You're in the only shelter that no storm can take down and his name is Jehovah God, Yahweh. There's, there's, there's no other shelter, there's no other shelter when it comes to the spiritual battles, there's no other shelter when it comes to the physical battles that can keep you safe the way God keeps you safe According to scripture, we're all in the palm of his hand anyway. We're all in the palm of his hand anyway. And so God is our fort. God is our fortress. He is the wall. He is the shelter that keeps us safe. Look at it, verse 1. There's a key word in the first verse. He who, what church? Dwells. He who dwells in the shelter. He who dwells. If if you want to receive all of the benefits that the shelter provides, you absolutely must dwell within the shelter. It would be like having, having an umbrella uh, closed up in the pouring down rain, and you're upset because you're getting soaking wet. If you want to get dry, what do you got to do with your umbrella? You got to open it up and get up under it. See, even if you just open it and hold it out here, you still going to get wet? Absolutely, you're going to get wet. The only way to receive the benefit of the shelter from the umbrella during the downpour is to get under the shelter of the umbrella. And so verse 1 says, he who dwells in the shelter of the Almighty, of the Most High. And there's something really cool about that word dwell. Look at it again, Psalm 91.1. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High. High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Uh, the Hebrew word for dwell is yesab. Everybody say yesab. Yesab has an incredible meaning when you understand what is the psalmist saying here when the psalmist says, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High. What does it mean to dwell? Is it, is it just to stay up underneath of it? Absolutely not. It's much more beautiful than that. To yesab, listen to this, to Yasab not only means to live there, it also means to inhabit the place, but then it takes a gigantic leap forward in the meaning. Yasab means to be married with it. And so we are the bride of who? Christ. And if we're to dwell, if listen, this is good stuff, man, praise the Lord. If we're to dwell in the shelter of God, 
I'm to be so committed to being in there. You're to be so committed to being in the shelter that the Hebrew word yasab, Y-A-S-A-B, the Hebrew, the Hebrew word yasab actually means that you're to be married into the position there. It's good stuff. And many Christians, when life brings up a storm and they feel as though they've been beat down and they wonder, why have I been beat down? It's, you were never meant to be beat down like that. It's just because you got up out of the shelter of God. You didn't dwell there. You weren't walking fresh in the newness of God and the relationship that God and the goodness of God, uh, the relationship that, that God has with you. New joy comes how often? Every morning. And so whose job is it to receive the new joy? Ours or God's? It's ours. It's my job. It's, it's your job to make sure that we've received new joy. And there's nothing you're going through this morning that overpowers that new joy. Which means if you're not walking in new joy today, you're missing it. To Yasab, truly to dwell. Look at the second verse. The second verse, the word of God says, I will say to the Lord God, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I what, church? Trust. Verse 2 uses... Uh, the words refuge and fortress. Verse 1 used the word shelter. Verse 2 uses refuge and fortress. Refuge, if you're taking notes, jot this down. Refuge is a place where you go for aid. It is, it is a place for help. Relief uh, uh, is, is uh, where you go. If you need relief, you're going, you're going to that place of refuge. But the word fortress, the word fortress is a place of stronghold which means no, how, no, no, no matter how high, how strong, how rough the winds in your life are, you're in the stronghold of God. You will not be budged. I'm in the fortress. So we've gone from a shelter to a refuge. Shelter, we're to be married in there. Uh, a place of refuge, which is a place where I go for aid. I go for assistance. God, you are my only help. Amen. And then we get into a place of fortress, which is an absolute stronghold. And so when you understand all of that mixed into just the first two verses, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. It's, it's not known for sure exactly who wrote the, the 91st Psalm. But what the brother is saying is this, I know who God is because I'm living with him every day of my life. And he's not just the place that I run for safety, he's the place that I run for aid and help, and he's the place that I run because he's my protector in my life. He's, he's my fortress, he's my refuge, and according to the first verse, he's my shelter. That's my God. And see, today... When we understand that God is all three of those things for us. Verse 1, he's my shelter. Verse 2, he's my refuge. Verse 2, he's my fortress. And we, we do what it says. We dwell in there. Then our lives are full of much more victory. Do you believe that, church? Much, 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 much. So much more victory when we're dwelling in the house of God. I want to take you somewhere else. Go to... Look, 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 look at verse 3. Actually, before we turn to a different text, look at, look at verse 3. Psalm 91, verse 3. And this is, this is what uh, it says. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler. Now, this is what's so cool. Verse 1 and 2, he's saying, ah, ah, ah. But remember last week we read in Scripture, all of us are witnesses. Right? Everybody's a witness to the goodness of God. We all have to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's done going from I saying what God has done, and now he's done going from I to uh, talking about self, and now he's reaching out to some folks. Watch what happens, how the language changes. And he will deliver who? You. He's saying, I, I, I know that, that God's my shelter, God's my refuge, and God's my fortress, and let me tell you what God can do for you. So look at verse 3. For he will deliver you 
from the stare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night nor the arrow that flies by day nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes. Think about that. Think about that. He goes from being personable. This is how it's affected me to now. Let me tell you how it will affect who? You. (laughs) This is why I was so okay with going down and being led by the spirit in Tennessee. Because I just knew that God is waiting for people to just say, okay, God, use me. And every, every time we begin to evangelize down there, it, it just pointed right back to God, what God can do, what God can do, what God can do, what God can do. If I remember right, in the three or four days that we were down there, we only had one person turn Jesus down, just one person. Just one person. Yeah, his name was Robert. And Robert was one of these guys that I'm sitting there just trying to, God, just get Jesus in them. And Robert looks at me and says, how do you know we're even here, man? I looked at him and said, because we're here. He says, no, man, that's what the government wants you to think, man. I said, no, 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 Robert. We're here, man. Matter of fact, uh, him, his mother, his dad had just died early in the year, and, and his mother owned all these warehouses, uh, these three big warehouses, huge warehouses in one of these poor communities we were in. And I told Brother Jim, I said, man, I wish I'd have thought about it because I'd have called his mother over and said, uh, your boy Robert here, uh, you pay Robert, yes? Oh, yeah, he works for me. Well, Robert says he's not here, so stop paying him. I begin to go back and forth trying to prove Jesus to a man. I, I mean, I really wanted Robert to get saved. I wanted Robert. I was just trying, trying, trying. And finally I told him, I said, Robert, listen, man, listen. There's, there's a very real place called heaven and there's a very real place called hell. And if you don't have Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior in your life, you're not getting into heaven. And that means that you're only able to get into hell. Do you know that? And he looks at me and says, that sounds like a threat. I said, no threat, it's just the truth, man, it's the word of God. Sad to say, Robert did not come to the faith that day, but seed was planted in his mind. I looked at him before we left, and I said, Robert, I can prove what I believe, but do you acknowledge that in your faith you might be wrong? And he thinks for a minute, he looks at me and says, yeah, I do. I could be wrong. And I said, man, I know I'm not. I know I'm not. And you have to deal with the thought process, brother, that you just could be wrong and what happens next. It tore me to pieces leaving that antique store knowing that we just left a soul that would not come to Jesus. But I pray. And when we go down there again, guess what one of my first stops is going to be? Robert. He had a for sale sign on the building. The first thing he said when we walked into his mother's antique store, huge place, huge place. First thing he said when we walked in there was not, hey, how you doing? He says, are you two here to buy the building? Because I'll sell it to you. No, we're not. But we'll tell you about Jesus. See, the psalmist goes from talking about I, and then he goes to saying, you, this is what God will do for you. This is what God for do, would do for you. And what I'm saying is, is that we need to take the example from the psalmist, and we need to start pleading with family and friends that are lost and, and dying and going to hell if they don't have an intervention of the soul with Jesus. And, and we need to start telling these people, let me tell you how God changed me, and God can change who, church? You. Because this is what the lost are desperately longing to hear. Go to Exodus chapter 14. 
with me, if you will, church. Exodus 14. And we're going to begin with the 10th verse. When you get there, Exodus chapter 14, verse 10. Exodus 14, 10, the word of God says this, praise the Lord. It says, when, when Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they, greatly, and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us up out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, fear not. What did he say do, church? Stand firm. Remember Psalms 91 verse 2 says that God is my refuge and my what? Fortress. Fortress is a stronghold which means when you are standing in the presence of God, there's nothing come against you that's going to prevail, is it? No weapon formed against you shall what? Prosper. Look at it, verse 13. And Moses said to the people, now Moses is looking at all of Israel. He's looking at all of Israel, okay? And Moses says to the people, fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you in church today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. You know at the exact spot, this is really cool, you can Google it and see it for yourself. At the exact spot where this encounter went down, divers and scientists have gone under the water and they're finding and have found many already wheels of chariots that are of the time frame where this went down and coral has grown all around it and barnacles and stuff like this, but it's still in the shape of the actual chariot wheels. Incredible. You look, you look at reality, you look at reality and then you see people like Robert and you just hurt for him because he's not coming to the true truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But the proof is in the pudding. It's there. These events happen and you can go back to these places and see remnants. You can see actual proof. But look back at verse 13. And Moses said to the people, fear not, stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you when church today. See, uh, Psalms 91 verses 1 through 8 is all about the, the brother telling the people, la, 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 God is our protector God is our safe place. God is our refuge. We need not fear. We need not fear. You, you look at someone like Moses and he says, stand firm because this day you'll see the deliverance of the Lord. Stand firm. This day you'll see God working in your life. Stand firm. Need not fret. Need not run. You've got a safe place. You've got a safe place in a shelter. You've got aid that's coming from God, the hand of God, in a refuge. And you've got a stronghold in the fortress of God. If you just rest alone in his presence, all will be well. And I didn't know that God was going to give uh, Pastor Jim that word to share this morning. But it sure is lining up with the word that he shared. If, if you're here today and you're currently going through something like that, I'm just telling you, just look, have faith, stand firm. Don't waver. Don't move. Trust and know that God is who he says he is. Amen? God is who he says he is. Go back to Psalm 91 verse uh, 9 quickly, please. Psalm 91 9. While you're turning there, I want to I want to remind you of something. When, when Moses says, fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today, he's basically saying, come on and get on out of the storm. Come on, come on, you don't, you don't have to do it. You don't have to do it. Come on, get out of the storm. See, see the work that God's going to do for you today. How many parents have hollered out to your children, come on, get up out the rain. Get on in here out the rain. 
Come on, get, if a storm coming, go ahead and put everything away. Come on, get, get on his side. I'm telling you, as children of God, listen, it is the power of God and the presence of God that keeps us safe during the storm. And Moses says, if you just come on in and let God do what God tells you he's going to do, God will do it. But you keep getting yourself in the way, Israel. You keep getting yourself in the way. This is what was so beautiful about the, psalm, the 91st Psalm. Listen to this. You got to get this if you don't get nothing else. This is what was so incredible about, about the 91st Psalm. Uh, the psalmist, again, we don't know exactly who he is, but the psalmist in 91, 1 and 2 says, God is the shelter, refuge, and fortress. You know what's incredible about that? Most of the Old Testament, the Jews were homeless. Think about that. They were wanderers. They were wanderers in disobedience. The Jews, for the most of the Old Testament, were homeless people looking for the promised place, the promised land. They were homeless. They were just wanderers because of their disobedience. And how incredible is it that in this 91st Psalm they're told, God is your shelter. God is your safe place. God is where you get aid and help. God is your refuge. God is your fortress. They needed to hear that. Because for so long, they were a homeless folk. For so long. And the only thing that kept them out of the blessing of God was their disobedience to God. And so we look at that in our own lives. What keeps blessing from our businesses? What keeps blessings from our lives? What keeps blessings from our marriages? What keeps blessing uh, from our younger children that are living under our roof? What keeps blessing from what we do? It's disobedience to God. That's it. You want to be blessed? Obedience. You want to be fruitful? Obedience. You want to walk in favor and be anointed? Obedience. Obedience to the Father is key. And we're going to see that in a minute right here in the, in the 91st Psalm. So go back. I ask you to turn there. Hopefully you're there. Psalms 91. Look at the ninth verse. Psalms 91 9 says this. Because you have made the Lord God your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Now, now think about that, uh, the, the benefits of what 9 and 10 just says. Now, now, now here it comes. No evil shall have victory over you. No plague shall come near your house. There, there is no evil that can overcome you when you're in the shelter of God. Amen? Look at the 11th verse. Here it is. Psalms 91, uh, verse, verse 11. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent. You will trample underfoot. Underfoot. How many of you believe and know and understand that your enemy, Satan, Jesus says, who prowls around, how many of you know he's already been disarmed? Say he's already been defeated. He's already been disarmed. What did that? Jesus on the cross. He's already been defeated. He's already been disarmed. He's a defeated foe. And here we're even told in the 91st Psalm, you can walk across your enemy and fear not. And so look at it here. Psalms 91, uh, verse 11 through 13. Psalms 91, 11 through 13. Uh, says this, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent. You will trample underfoot. Now, we've talked about that. Now, I want to go right into Psalms 91, 14. Psalms 91, 14 through 16 says this, because he holds fast to me in what, church? Love, I will what? Deliver him. Because he holds Fast to me in love, I will deliver him. Look at what it says. Look at what it says. Psalms 91, 14. I will protect him because he knows my what? Name. See, it, this is why the, the Hebrew word for dwell means to actually be married into the process. You got to know who God is if you want the benefits of God. Amen? I mean, so because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. Look at verse 15, church. When he calls to me, I will what? When he calls to me, I will answer him and I will be with him in what kind of time? Trouble. Hear that. 
When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. And with long life, I will satisfy him and show him the way in my salvation. Show him my salvation. See, God is desperately looking for a people that is ready and hungry and willing to lead people and show people the way into salvation. How many people here believe we're in the last days? The last days. Then guess what? We should be excited. We should be excited about this opportunity that God has allowed you and I to live in this last day. And it's up to the church. It's up to the church. It's up to the church to share the good news as this could very well be the last way out. The last day. It's up to the church. Yesterday, we were blessed enough to attend a a Christian college football game and traffic began to back up a little bit and there were police barricades up at the front. They had rerouted the parking and there was this one woman there was this one woman who was sharing with people as she was walking up the street. You know how when you get good news that you know people want, you don't mind telling people about it? She was telling every, but didn't even work here. She was telling everybody, roads closed, go ahead and turn around. Come to the next vehicle, roads closed, go ahead and turn around. Next vehicle, roads closed, go ahead and turn around. My father-in-law said, that woman coming up here to tell us something. I said, I know she is. We rolled the window down and just waited because I knew she was ready to say something. Roads closed. Go ahead, turn around. You see, it's it's something that when we get some news that we feel is going to be beneficial to other people, we could get so worked up just wanting to stand around telling everybody about it. And all I'm saying is if we could just get that excited about our faith in Jesus Christ and say, hey, look, the road's about to be closed. You better turn around. There's a time coming where the end of this earth will take place and that eastern sky is going to split slam wide open. There's going to be trumpet blast and call of God and God's going to look at his son Jesus and say I've had enough, the time is now son, go get your bride, go down there and bring that church right back up here where they were created to be to begin with go down there and get your bride and it's the job of the church in the last day and we're all responsible because we know we're in the last day to go forth and tell people like Robert, hey look man we're really here and this is the last day what will you do with it what will you do with it you know what's so incredible is that brother Jim and I left Sunday evening and went down for three or four days into Tennessee with with the only agenda to do what God told us to do we didn't know anybody we didn't have any appointments set we just wanted to go evangelize and hit the streets and see who God would put in front of us And do you know, just by being willing, we led more souls to Jesus in the poorest towns of Tennessee than we've led in this building in a month. And what I'm saying is, don't get so caught up in the arena. Don't get so caught up in the event. Don't get so caught up in the atmosphere that you miss God doing something right in the midst of the goodwill that you're shopping in. Right in the midst of the shopping center that you're shopping in right in the midst of a neighbor's front yard, a neighbor's front porch at a doctor's visit, at a doctor's appointment. Don't miss what God's doing right there in the moment just because it doesn't say church on the sign at the door. But God wants you to visit the unchurched. The unchurched. And when we stood in that goodwill for about an hour preaching, what started out with a few people in the store, more came, and some more came, and some more came, and some more came. And everybody stopped shopping, and they circled around us and just stood quiet listening. Until one believer, off to the side, 30-some, 40-some minutes later, said, I can't hold back. My cup filled up, and I got to say something. I'm pretending like I'm shopping, but I haven't moved. Amen! (laughs) 
And all of a sudden, the chain broke. Satan lost. Elderly woman on the other store, side of the store, in a circle, she said, That's right! Amen! And there's this little 10 year old girl that I shared with you that God showed me. And she's just so staring into the words of God in the testimony that she's about falling over, forward like this. And she was just there for about 30, 40 minutes listening to every word that was preached in the middle of a Google store. And I pray she never forgets it. You don't have to be in here to share what God's done for you. You come here to learn. You come here to grow. But then you go out there to do the work of God. In here we praise Him. In here we worship Him. In here we acknowledge Him. In here we honor Him. In here we love Him. In here we love one another. But out there we do the work. That's where the most work is needed. Jesus says, I didn't come for the healthy. I come for the sick. And the way I see it is we got a room full of healthy folks. We need to fill up some empty seats with some sick people so that by the power of God, we can get them healthy too. Let's stand and pray. Father, it's our desire to serve you. God, it's it's our desire to be obedient to you. God, it's, it's, it's our desire to love you. Father, I pray in the precious name and the blood of your son, Jesus Christ, that you would use us to love the sick how you would love them, that you would use us to love the homeless how you would love them, that you would use us to love the hurting in the way that you would love them, that you would use us to help people in the way that you would help people. Let us know, Father. Let us know where to go, what to do, when to do it, how to help. Let us know, Father. Let us know from Amelia to Dinwiddie to Nottaway to Blackstone to Farmville to Powhatan and Goochland and Chesterfield and Richmond. Let us know, let us know, let us know how we can help. And we don't put limitations on it. We don't want any limitations. We just want to be a people that says, God, use us for your glory. God, use us. Use us to love the people that you want loved in this very moment, this very day, at this very time and hour. Use us. Use us. If you're here today and you've never asked Jesus Christ to save your soul, there's no better time than right now. What what an incredible day to ask Jesus to be your Lord and get on board with this vision of loving people. What better day to get on board and ask Jesus to be the Lord of your life and and get on with this vision of sharing with people, being a blessing to people, encouraging people, helping the lost and the sick of life. So if you're here today and you've never asked Jesus to be Lord of your life, and today you're ready to acknowledge him as Lord, I, I invite you to raise your hand right where you are. If that's you're ready for it will forever change you and that my friends is a good thing that is a good thing anybody here acknowledge today that you need Jesus as your Lord and you've not been walking with him father I pray for every soul in this room that if they're running today they stop I pray for every Christian that's already saved in this house. Father, that you would plant an excitement in every one of us to be the hands and feet of your son, Jesus. May our ears be attentive to the call of your voice. In the precious name and the blood of Jesus Christ, everybody say, amen. Let's give God a clap of praise. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. I had I had made an announcement